What are the things that you incorporate in your life now? I don't, I don't even know how old you are because you look the same as you did when I met you 30 years ago. But. I'm going to be 80 in a couple months. No, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. God, you look mazel tough. You look fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so so your obviously mind is bright, your skin is clear, your eyes are good. I mean, what, what are you doing uh, day to day given all that you've learned in your lifetime and all the amazing access you've had to the leading edge research in how to keep healthy? Okay, what, what are you well, doing? I follow my own dietary advice. You know, I eat an anti-inflammatory diet, varied. I you know, all the things that I should be doing. I try to be physically active. Uh, I walk as my, as my favorite physical activity. Mm. Uh, I have two big dogs that take me for walks. And I think being with companion animals is a healthy strategy. Uh, I like to laugh and I like to spend time with friends and cook. Uh, I really attend to good rest and sleep. I do my breathing exercises. Um, uh, I keep engaged in the world and my teaching is certainly provides that. Yeah. I can't imagine retiring. I mean, that's just does not, not of interest to me. Yeah. I think that's so key. I think the, the, you know, you look at the data on retirement it actually is a death sentence. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've seen that too within six yeah. months of retiring, many men, you know, get really sick or die. Yeah. So are there any, are there any things that you do that are a little bit extra? Like I, I you written a lot about supplements and nutritional yeah. deficiencies and, you, you know, you've recommended a lot of supplements over the years. Where are you at with that now? And what do you think, what is your thoughts about what you know, should I be taking? You know, I take vitamin D, I take CoQ10, I take uh, an antioxidant mix, uh, I take some extra magnesium, I use a variety of mushroom supplements, which I think are really good for immune health. Um, I think that's, you know, I think that's basically what I, it. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you know, there's a lot of, uh, work you've done in, in the world of mushrooms. You've been very yes. into mushrooms <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and, and we're, we're entering a mushroom renaissance here. Quite amazing. Uh, yeah. It's, I mean, so many friends are starting companies with mushrooms. I have a friend who started a company called Hero Diapers or Hero <laughs> Technologies, which is essentially using mycelial technology to, to digest the, the, the diaper and the poop. How great. How and, great. And it actually can eat all the plastic and landfills. It's really, yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, now we're, there's this whole field of psychedelic assisted therapies yeah, yeah. and for trauma and depression and end of life therapy. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite amazing to see Paul Stamets, I know you're close with, yeah. is, is now getting a lot of attention, is creating these microdosing stacks. And how do you see the, uh, the sort of emerging research around mushrooms and both, both therapeutic mushrooms, adaptogenic mushrooms, and also um, the psychedelic mushrooms? And I want, I want well, to draw on your yeah. ethnobotany uh, sure. background to kind of give us a deep dive into this. Well, I got, I got interested in the uh, therapeutic benefits of mushrooms a long time ago, and I was one of the <laughs> first people to write about them you were. and try to get people to do research on them. And I first came onto this from looking at traditional Chinese medicine, where mushrooms are highly esteemed as remedies, and there'd been almost no research in the West on them. So I think especially for immune modulation, for increasing resistance to viral infections, cancer, there's a lot there. Um, yeah. You know, th that's a big area of research. The psychedelic mushrooms, this is part of the whole psychedelic renaissance that's happening now. It's long overdue, and I think it's a good thing. And it may be that, uh, you know, maybe this is the one thing that can save our culture. <laughs> uh, frankly, I think we're in so much trouble. Uh, and you know, it may be that this is the consciousness change that can happen. Uh, it's possible. I can't, in some ways I can't believe how it is penetrating mainstream culture. I saw yeah. an article, listen to this, this was out a month ago in town and country magazine yeah. <laughs> of, of all things, town and country magazine titled, why is everyone smoking toad venom? Yeah. In town wow. and country. Wow. I mean, unbelievable. And Vogue had a cover story on psilocybin a few months ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really out there now. And yeah. when I was traveling before the <laughs> pandemic, didn't matter what subject I was talking on, healthy aging, anti-inflammatory diet, integrative medicine, I would get questions about psychedelics. You yeah. know, this people are curious. They want to know. They want access to it. It's happening. I, I think it's a good thing. And, and how do you, how do you think that, um, you know, this, this, this movement is going to end up, I mean, you think, you think we're going to legalize it. Do you think it's going to be part of our traditional medical therapies for chronic conditions? I mean, 
Yeah, I think we're going to see, first of all, you know, I think MDMA will be made available for post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, psilocybin for drug-resistant depression, you know, a few other things like this. Uh, I think there will be more and more people trained in how to use psychedelic therapy. So that's one movement that's going to happen. The other is, I think, just penetration of the general culture that people are going to be microdosing and experimenting. So mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how it's going to play out. And I have some worries about, you know, are big companies going to try to take it over and control it? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, there's like a lot of public companies that are now investing in psychedelic research, yeah. mushroom a technologies. Lot. You know, I, I think Paul, Paul Samets, I heard him speak recently, and he talked about this work he's doing around dementia and Alzheimer's using yep. microdosing and yep. using a stack of lion's mane and psilocybin and, and niacin. And, niacin. And, yeah. and, and it's fascinating research to show the really impact on these neurodegenerative mm -hmm. diseases. How do you think that's working? I, I don't think we know enough yet. I don't think we have enough data. There's not, but, but it's <laughs> promising. It's a promising area of research. So I think we should follow it and see what happens. And, and you, you said something very provocative, which is if, if basically if, if all Americans took mushrooms, <laughs> that magic <laughs> mushrooms, that everything would shift. And why do you say that? And what does it do to the brain? And how does it change our perceptions in ways that shift things toward you know, a more there's an awful lot of world? experiential evidence of people having uh, very radical shifts in how they perceive the world and their relationship mm -hmm. to it as a mm -hmm. result of psychedelic experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think some people become very aware of the environmental crisis and how their behavior influences it, um, mm -hmm. or their connection with nature, connection with other people. You know, we, we need a change in consciousness if we're going to avoid disaster. You yeah. know, things seem to be heading in a very bad direction on all fronts. And I think the only thing that can avert it is a change in consciousness. And the only agents that I see out there that have the potential to do that are psychedelics, not just mushrooms, it all of them. Yeah, it's really true. And I, I think it got such a bad rap, uh, but it was really a key part of psychiatric research back in the 50s. Yep. And Michael Pollan did a great job in yep. how to change your mind about mapping out, you know, how that's all yep. unfolded and why we got so sidetracked. And now it's all coming back. And I, I you know, I don't know about you, but I, I, I would say the experiences I had in college and I, now I think it's okay to talk about it. Yeah, people, sure. <laughs> most right. people would not say yeah. anything about it. But, you know, I, I definitely had the experience of it. This was in the 70s and, and it was a thing. And I remember always doing it in a sort of a sacred container mm -hmm. of nature with friends, not just going to parties yep. and taking a bunch of drugs, but actually having a very intentional experience. And it really profoundly affected the way I saw the world, the way I saw myself, what mattered to me, understanding the intersection and connectivity between things. I think you, you and I were similar in that way. We both, we see the patterns in the data. We see the way yep. things are connected. We see sort of the ecological view. You're an ecological doctor. I think that's really... The, what 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 we're doing is ecological medicine. Yeah, and and I think that that hugely influenced me, and and started to shift my thinking towards more of this kind of medicine. Was was that something that happened to you? I know you went to South America. You had all these yeah, experiences. Yeah, but I did. You I know I I began experimenting with psychedelics when I was in college uh, long ago. That was a Timothy and, Leary, Richard Alpert yeah, era, right? Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but yes, I think a profound a profound influence on my way of thinking and my way of thinking about medicine. And what, what, what happened? What were some of the experiences that you had? Well, I think some of it was really seeing very graphically how what was inside my head was connected with what was outside my head and that I could yeah. change things out there by changing things in here. Yeah. It's, it's so powerful. And, and then there's a whole other class, I think, that are now also mushrooms that are arising that um, are therapeutic mushrooms that we really haven't taken advantage of, uh, that I, I've been using a lot more personally than I'm using my patients, with it's cordyceps, reishi, maitake, shiitake, you know, um, lion's, lion's mane. mane. Yeah. 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 All these incredible mushrooms. But that, these that have been shaga. long used in Asian medicine and Japanese mm. medicine, Chinese medicine, Korean medicine, and mm. they've been extremely valued and they've been unknown in our part of the world until recently. Yeah. So I think they're and, good and, to incorporate into the diet, the edible ones, and to consider taking us supplements it's true i useful. actually eat a lot of mushrooms i eat you know Good shiitake thing. and maitake mushrooms you yeah. know you can buy yeah. a whole variety of mushrooms not those little white button mushrooms which yeah that's that the only thing we had available for <laughs> years and now suddenly we have all these new mushrooms available yeah and, and they, they the science behind them is quite impressive you know lion's mane helps the brain heal and yeah yeah, there's a there's a very very robust body of research accumulating now on these mushrooms. They were ignored for so long. Do you take any of the supplemental mushrooms? As I do powders or I, I take capsules of uh, mostly capsules of uh, lion's mane, cordyceps, 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I actually make a smoothie in the morning and I have the powders and I just mix all of the different mushrooms in my smoothie and I don't really notice it. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> great. But some yeah. of them taste great too. You know, as you know, maitake, yeah. shiitake, these are delicious uh, yeah. edible mushrooms. And there's so, companies like, uh, or Sigmatic that now you can make yeah. mushroom teas and yeah. a lot of companies are emerging that are, are, yeah, are making this, this stuff thing. really quite accessible. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. This is actually really interesting. The worst food in our entire data set of 51 million no. glucose data points is... Oh, yeah. oh, I want to hear this. Drum roll, please. Skittles. <laughs> Skittles. Skittles. Wow. Not surprising because it's a refined carbohydrate 